Now, the Prime Minister may be bracing for tough economic news, hikes in both inflation and interest rates, despite some recent success dealing with rising prices. A new forecast from the respected Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development says the UK economy is set for the highest inflation rate of the world's G7 advanced economies. And on Thursday, it's thought that the Bank of England will raise interest rates for the 15th consecutive time. Well, with me now is Lord King, who was uh, Governor of the Bank of England between 2003 and 2013. Lord King, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. A pleasure, Wilf. Um, so let's talk about interest rates first of all. And, and interesting coming off the back of a speech yesterday by the former Prime Minister Liz Truss, who said of the Bank of England specifically as it relates to interest rates that she criticised them for pumping the system full of money, for keeping interest rates uh, too low for too long and for allowing excess excessive government spending. W would you agree with the gist of that assessment? Well, I don't think I'd single out the Bank of England. I think all central banks made the same mistake, which was they fell into the trap of thinking that because they had a target of 2%, that inflation was bound to come back to 2% even if they printed a lot of money. And that's a very strange idea to have. You know, I call it the King Canute theory of inflation, in which people think that if you just say something, that it automatically occurs. It doesn't. And what happened was that they printed a lot of money in the belief that it didn't matter very much, and it did. But this was not just the Bank of England. The bigger mistakes were made by the Federal Reserve. Uh, well, mistakes were also made by the European Central Bank. And I think it's the economics profession that has persuaded people that somehow money has nothing to do with inflation, which is a very odd viewpoint. Inflation is a fall in the value of money. So if you print lots of money, we know from history that you will eventually get inflation. Now, the good news is that that was a mistake made in 2020 and 21. 2022, central banks corrected that mistake and started to raise interest rates belatedly, but they did raise them to, I think, more normal levels. And I think where we are now in 2023, it's really in the balance as, as to what should be done. I don't think that they're not making big mistakes now. They're, they're unsure as to whether to raise a little bit more or not. Uh, and I don't think it matters a great deal. We're, we're in the right ballpark now, whereas 20 and 21, we were not. Would you pause on Thursday or would you raise? Well, I would not deign to give advice to to my successes. They have all the numbers, I don't. But I don't think it's going to make an enormous difference what happens on Thursday. I think we're in the right area now. Central banks are not making the mistakes that they were making in 2020 and 21. On the fiscal side, were there mistakes too on the, in 2020 and 2021, specifically when you consider the, the amount of spending almost perfectly matching up with the amount of money printed and the fact that the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak at the time, had to approve that monetary printing from the Bank of England? Well, I think I'd say two things on that. One is the furlough scheme was a very good idea. It was sensible. In the United States, unemployment shot up, went up to close to 15%. Here it hardly moved. The furlough scheme was a good idea. It was very expensive, but global pandemics don't happen too often, we hope. The second thing I'd say is that the Chancellor gives an indemnity to the Bank of England when it prints money and does quantitative easing, but it doesn't actually make the decision. That is for the Bank of England, and that is correct. So I don't think... I, I would not blame the Chancellor at all for what he did. I think that was the right response. I do think central banks went over the top in printing money when there was no need to. There was a great deal of activity by governments, mm -hmm. and there was no need for central banks to do a lot of quantitative easing. On, on the perhaps less negative side, I'm not sure if it's outright positive, but particularly post some recent economic revisions by the ONS, is it impressive that the UK economy is doing better than the likes of Germany and, and some parts of continental Europe, albeit worse than the US? So I, 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 I don't think it's unexpected. And I think people exaggerate the significance of small changes in, in statistics. So people here got terribly excited about the fact that it looked as if our recovery was slightly slower than other countries. Now the statistics have been revised and, it, well, as you said, we're doing, we did better than Germany coming out of COVID. But frankly, we cannot measure GDP that precisely. You know, when you make a recipe in the kitchen, you can measure the ingredients on the scale, 200 grams, 100 grams. It means something. It's real. But GDP 
is very difficult to measure. It, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a balance between lots of different activities, people out there making steel, people driving lorries, we having a conversation in the Sky Studios. How do you weight all these things together? People get far too excited about small differences in measures of GDP. It's even quite easy to make mistakes making measurements in the kitchen, as I can certainly attest <laughs> to uh, as well. Um, I wanted to pick up a, a little bit further on some of the lines from Liz Truss's speech yesterday. Uh, not, not, not all of them, but some of the broad uh, things she was hinting at. And she was critical of big economic institutions in general, including the Bank of England, including the Treasury of sort of being too ingrained in orthodoxy uh, and uh, resistant to, to new ideas. She calls it the, the um, anti-growth coalition. Do you think there's some truth in that? Well, there may be a little truth in it, but I think the big problem is that it's politicians who must take responsibility for thinking about the balance between tax and spend, how much regulation we have. I think there is no doubt that we could find more efficient ways of achieving the regulation we want to have. But that's a question of a careful, detailed analysis of what needs to be changed. You can't just issue a press release and say we're going to get rid of regulations. And I think that politicians are the people who are very reluctant to own up to the fact that we as a country are, you know, we have lots of good ideas about new investments we'd like to make, particularly in the public sector. This may mean more government spending. That means higher taxes. We have a budget deficit. As a country, we are saving less as a share of our national income than any other country in the G20. And there is no way that we can increase investment in the United Kingdom without increasing how much we save. The first and easiest step towards that would be to reduce the budget deficit and try gradually to bring down the national debt as a share of national income. So, so it's really interesting that you mentioned that and, and a more broad idea that's... Is it fair to say that at the moment the Chancellor and the Prime Minister are too focused almost in a laser-like manner on inflation? Should they be a little more relaxed about that and be willing to take other steps like you're mentioning? Well, I'd like to see a, a more imaginative approach to some of the big challenges in economic policy that we face. The irony is that we do face lots of big challenges, whether it's inflation, whether it's the national debt, whether it's the tax system, whether it's pensions, whether it's the National Health Service. And we end up now with, with two political parties, both desperate to win the next election. But you wonder why, because what is the big radical reform to it in any of these areas? It's not clear. I think that the Chancellor is understandably wants to bring down inflation. And I think the Bank of England will bring down inflation. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why it can't. And I think whatever happened in the past, they're not repeating those mistakes. And I think we are on track to bring inflation back down close to the target. It's very hard to know how long it will take. But nevertheless, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think the bigger problem is that we've left a very large amount of national debt to our grandchildren. They're going to be working hard to pay it off and to service the debt because interest rates are not going to go back to zero again. And I think as a country, my generation at least, ought to be willing to do something to improve the growth performance of the economy so that my grandchildren, when they have to service a large national debt, will at least have a healthier economy, generating more income out of which they can service that debt. I wanted to touch, Lord King, on the uh, debanking scandal that's been in the press over the summer, of course, uh, with Nigel Farage front and, and centre on it. An FCA report is due this week on the issue and some FT reporting, which has been backed up by some Sky News reporting, uh, suggests uh, that the uh, data was going to come out in the next couple of days and would show no cases of political views uh, being the primary reason for personal account closures across the 34 banks that they have been assessing. Uh, Nigel Farage has come out to say that the FCA is part of the problem. He, he calls it a whitewash, amongst uh, other things. What's your take on all of that? Well, I don't know enough about the individual case of Nigel Farage, and, and that's a matter for Coots, and Coots have clearly gone through a very difficult time. And it, it, pretty obviously, he was discriminated against. I think more generally, there is a big issue about what are called politically exposed persons. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating that Parliament, all of whom are politically exposed persons, have suddenly got very interested in this question. Uh, and it's a good example, I think, of regulation that was...
introduced with a perfectly sensible motive of trying to eliminate potential corruption and money laundering for terrorist financing purposes. But the way it's been applied, it's been applied to lots and lots of people who have absolutely nothing to do with that. And I'm not clear how effective the regulations are in dealing with people who really are likely to be money laundering. And th this is right across the whole regulatory spectrum. Uh, and I think there is... It, it, I don't think it's sensible to blame the regulators as such. They are trying to implement the regulations they've been asked to do through Parliament. And they have faced the incentive that if they get one case wrong, they're going to be blamed by you in the media mm -hmm. and government politicians. So they've got every incentive to overdo the regulation, be overly cautious about it. And I think we've got to find a way in which there's a more balanced and sensible approach to how these regulations are imposed. Do you think Alison Rose was unfortunate to lose her job? Well, I think she was unfortunate because I can't believe that the major issue facing her at her desk and on any day was what we do about Nigel Farage. This was a matter for coots. But I think that by, by talking to a journalist about an individual's account, it was a very unfortunate error of judgment, but it was an error of judgment, and I don't think there was much alternative to her going. I wanted to touch on net zero, and uh, you gave an interview recently to the, to the Telegraph, and the headline of the write-up of that said, Lord King, net zero obsession has fuelled uh, inflation. Is, is that the gist of, of your view on this? No, I don't quite know where that headline came from. It certainly didn't relate to the comments I made. The main comment I made was this. If we as a country decide to go for net zero, that's fine. But that's for the United Kingdom as a whole. The most efficient way to reach net zero for the UK is that some organisations will be net negative and others net positive, depending on how costly it is for them to reduce emissions. But we seem to have gone down a track in which every individual organisation is aiming at net zero. This is a very inefficient way of, appro of approaching it. A far more effective way would be not to have all these regulations, but simply to introduce a tax on carbon emissions where people who use things which imply carbon emissions will end up paying more and the market will deal with it. And then you'll end up in a situation where some businesses will be net positive and others net zero, net negative, but the country as a whole will eventually approach net zero. That would be a sensible way of doing it. And the depressing fact is that governments around the world, particularly in the UK and the United States, have decided they won't go down that road. And I think we're in real danger of creating a very costly way of reaching net zero. It's not that the objective is wrong, it's that the way of doing it is going to be extremely costly. Do, do you think that the Bank of England should be talking about things like net zero or should it be just focused on monetary policy? Well, I think it should be focused on its main objective of achieving price stability. I you know, worked in the organisation, I worked in other organisations, the key to success is to have a very clear mission that everyone in the organisation understands and the best people in the organisation are focused on that one main objective. And the fact is that the Bank of England can't do very much about carbon emissions and, and climate change. And we've now got the point where, you know, a lot of banks and other financial institutions are being asked to report the emissions, not just of their own business, but of their customers and their suppliers. Now, the only way to describe that is mad, because they can't possibly know that. Mm -hmm. You know, my bank doesn't know my emissions. Uh, if I'm a small business, I don't know the emissions of my suppliers or my own customers. And it's, to, to me, it's reminiscent of that wonderful sketch in the old comedy series way back when, uh, beyond the fringe, uh, a, a take on the bureaucratic nature of how Britain fought the Second World War, when the RAF commander said to his, his pilot, he said, this is the moment for a futile gesture. <laughs> and many of the things that we're doing by way of regulation are futile gestures. Some people call it virtue mm -hmm. signalling, but it's a futile gesture. Climate change is too important to have futile gestures. It needs to have mm -hmm. a coherent policy. Um, sort of wrapping things up, Lord King, I wanted to ask uh, more broadly about where you think the power today is, the scale of it, of the Governor of the Bank of England, and whether they are sufficiently 
accountable. We talk about some of the mistakes that have been made. Uh, we talked about the possibility of making further mistakes. I presume you don't think they should ever be directly elected because it might not lead to experts of the profession like yourself getting the job. But could they be more regularly accountable than they are given the great power that that office, that position holds today, much more so than in decades past? Well, I think there is a question about the range of powers of the bank itself and the remit um, and whether that ought to be go back to something smaller. But I think the governor is incredibly accountable. I mean, there aren't many jobs, maybe football managers, where you go regularly on television uh, in front of the Treasury Committee and... But they never lose their job off the back of that. Well, they're appointed for a finite period when they then have to leave. Um, but, you, you know, you don't... It, the idea that somehow the government would just decide to sack the governor because something happened that they didn't like. But could the term be shorter? I mean, you talked... Well, it was shorter, but, I, I mean, then the problem we had was, which was true for about 30, 40 years, when the governor was appointed for five years but renewable for another five, every time the first five-year term came up, there was great speculation in the press as to whether the government was going to reappoint the governor. Mm -hmm. And what happened was they decided to make that decision earlier and earlier to avoid the speculation. We've now got, instead of two five-year terms, one eight-year term. That strikes me as very sensible, and I wouldn't make any change from that. But yeah, everybody, you on the television, people in newspapers, economists writing in the city, they're always writing about whether the governor of the Bank of England is doing the right thing. There is a vast amount of accountability. That isn't the issue, I think. The issue is, you know, is the bank trying to do too much? Well, Lord King, uh, thank you for joining us to add to that accountability with your, your scrutiny of recent decisions. It's always a pleasure to catch up. Thanks for coming in.